you all know him, so please let's welcome Paco, Paco Nathan. Paco, how are you? Thank you very much, Alita. Uh, really so grateful to be here at Big Things. Yes, you are You are a classic in this conference. We can't do this conference without you now. <laughs> you are so kind to join us all the way from California, I believe. Yes, yes. So? Out here in the Redwoods. Thank you for, I don't know if I, for, for this, is, it's going to be a long night for you or you're going to go to bed quite late. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Sorry for keeping you waiting, Paco. All yours. Le uh, looking forward to listening to you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, uh, let me see. Can you see my screen okay here? Uh, can uh, we see his screen okay? I'm not sure, Paco, okay. to be honest, because I don't see everything. You just, you just start, you carry on, we'll carry on, and we'll, <laughs> we'll take care of everything. Thank you. Okay, so all of the slides are online. I'll post a link later on. There's a lot of great links uh, within the slides, materials, uh, open source, uh, repos, uh, tutorials, other things that might be helpful as background information here. Um, and I, I, I must say, I'm, I'm grateful to get to present at Big Things. I, I miss uh, coming to Spain, I, I, uh, to all my friends uh, in Madrid and elsewhere in Spain, uh, you know, I just want to say I, I miss you and I hope I get to come back soon. Uh, look forward to that definitely next year and hopefully much sooner. This talk is about, yes, it, it, I, I got a note about sharing the presentation. Um, let me know if it's not, if it's not showing yet. Um, I think I have to do one more thing. Quick, 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 let's go to keynotes. There we go. Okay. That is perfect, Paco. Ah, okay, I think we're online now. Yes, go ahead. Um, great. So this talk here is about two big ideas. Uh, one is called graph thinking, and the other is called thinking sparse and dense. The graph thinking part is really more a message about business than technology, or more about how to think about the business problem and then be able to apply the technology. And the point there is to render complexity in a kind of business problem into value. And we do this through leveraging graph technologies. The other part of this, thinking sparse and dense, is about how to really take advantage of the hardware for complex data workflows when you're working with graphs. So these two ideas, they go hand in hand. They really need each other. Um, I'll also have a few words about leveraging open source. So in my, my role at Darwin, I help lead a team. Our team is working in very large graph infrastructure. Uh, in particular, we're working for uh, uh, some use cases in manufacturing in Europe. And uh, it's, it's really been a pleasure to uh, get to work in uh, some of these areas and especially see where open source can be applied in this. And the reason I, I wanna present this talk is because this word graph, I think you'll be hearing this a lot more. Obviously throughout the conference, uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of talks referencing about graph neural networks and how important this is for deep learning, for AI. But there are other aspects of graph as well. And I want to show how some of these parts of graph technologies are complementary and work together. So graph thinking, let's start out with an illustration. Uh, imagine we're somewhere in the woods. We're in a, a small village. Let's say it's a, a medieval village back in the Black Forest. Uh, just kind of show a little map here. And in this village, there's a pub. Pat is the person who tends the local pub. Pat has a friend named Hannah and a friend named Thomas. And now Hannah works the fields, grows the grain, and also has a friend named Aiden. And then Thomas raises poultry. And uh, Thomas buys grain from Hannah. Thomas also has a friend named Brenda. And then Aiden operates the mill right there on the stream and buys grain from Hana. Uh, Aiden also has a friend named Chris. And then Brenda works the brewery. She buys grain from Hana. She produces beer, sells back to the pub for Pat. She has a friend named Kim. Now Chris, Chris works the bakery. And in the bakery, Chris buys eggs from Thomas. He buys flour from Aiden at the mill. 
He makes bread that he sells back to Pat, who works the pub. And then Kim works the recyclery. So she collects the organic waste from these different businesses here and then composts that into fertilizer, sells it back to Hana to use out in the fields. So in the scope here of seven people, seven small businesses in a medieval village in the Black Forest, we have a circular economy. Okay, and we can show these, these relationships between the people as well as the businesses and the uh, producer consumer flows uh, involved in those businesses of the different types of products, how they're moving through the graph. We see these relationships, but there's a problem because if we were to take this and move it into a relational database, then it looks very different. It looks like this. On the left-hand side, you can see there's an entity uh, diagram here, the, the schema. On the right-hand side, you can see six tables. These have been normalized. They have primary keys. And the thing is that by, by virtue of normalizing this into relational form, we, we lose the perception of pattern. And the key aspects of the relationships in that village and, and between those people and those businesses, it's no longer something that's, that's immediately available. So for complex business contexts, network views are what bring the data closer to people who can make sense of it. And of course, this is a simple example. I, there's seven people in this graph. Imagine if there were 7 trillion people. Well, let's say 7 billion people, 7 trillion businesses maybe. Um, as you increase in scale, as you increase in the complexity of the relationships represented in the graph, the network views make it so that people who really understand the domain can make sense of it. And this involves acknowledging the com complexity of the business context. It involves that the, the goal is we need to identify patterns in the graph to be able to use that and make informed decisions. So thinking about patterns, here's some examples. Hana is relatively new in the village. She'd like to expand her business. She's noticed that her customer, Brenda, buys a lot of grain. So which other villagers are similar to Brenda? Well, if you look at the graph, you look at some of the patterns there, you find that Chris also sells product to Pat, as Brenda does. And Chris also sells organic waste to Kim, as Brenda does. So maybe the bakery is a good candidate. Maybe the bakery is one that's very similar to Brenda. It could be that the bakery could buy unmilled grain and make sprouts or malt or something like that. Also, Hannah is interested in sponsoring a co-marketing campaign, trying to drive demand for grain. Um, who are the customers of Hannah's customers? So if you look at the graph and you, you do some, some traversal here, it turns out that Chris, Pat, and Kim are each a minimum of two hops away. So Chris is showing up a couple of times in different measures. Okay, and then a tech billionaire uses time travel to relocate to a medieval village in the Black Forest. And the important question, of course, is which are the acquisition targets? So you can use this graph if you run a graph algorithm such as between a centrality, which is maybe not so far away from PageRank, kind of similar centrality there. But if you run this graph algorithm with this exact data, you'll see that both Hannah and Chris rank the highest in terms of centrality. They're really key players, businesses in this medieval village. And we can go on, but I, I wanna point out there's a larger article uh, and I, I want to uh, shout out to my good friend, Jürgen Mueller at uh, BASF. Uh, Jürgen and I put this together, this illustration of the village. And we have an article on Medium that goes into more detail. Now, the background on this is that uh, if you look back to the late 1990s, uh, Dave Snowden and others working at IBM in, in their consulting business globally, they defined something called Kinevin. It's a, a framework for assessing a business context, trying to understand what are the challenges that the leaders in that business face. And uh, this has been the genesis for uh, certain terms. Like for instance, if you have a simple case, it's called the known knowns. And in a simple business context, you know, you, you just establish what the facts are and you follow the rules, the best practices. It doesn't take a lot of training to do that. But then you get into a more complex or complicated uh, kind of business context. These are the known unknowns. 
And this is where you need some experts to go in and analyze the situation, analyze the data, try to determine cause and effect, solve for the known unknowns. And through this analysis, then you determine, okay, what types of trade-offs are there for decisions to take? But then if it gets more complex, this is the infamous unknown unknowns. This is the complex context where you really can't determine cause and effect through reduction techniques. Instead, you have to go in and perceive patterns and build a probe of the situation and perhaps do some experimentation. But understanding what patterns are emerging there is how you make an informed decision. And complex situations in business, this is what we face these days, right? When we're talking about climate, when we're talking about the complexities of global supply chain and problems there, when we talk about pandemics, these are complex issues. And these are the kind of situations that leaders face, organizations face, when they're approaching these kinds of problems. So let me shift gears a little bit and talk not about technology, but about how it is that people learn. There's a great book by Susan Ambrose from about a decade ago, where she, she talks about the journey that people go on when they're learning a new subject, when they're progressing from being a novice in a particular subject to becoming uh, more, more advanced, eventually becoming an expert in that field. And uh, Ambrose talks about this in terms of the cognitive structures, how people represent what they have learned really in terms of, you can think geometry. So when a novice is first beginning to learn a subject, uh, they probably start with some simple facts. These are probably not connected well, uh, maybe not a lot of context. But as they begin to learn more and more about this field, they start to piece together the facts. And so they have chains of association and they can start to ask some questions and really get more interaction with their environment. As they become a competent practitioner in this field, then what you see is cognitive structures where it's very similar to what we call decision trees in machine learning. And then as a person really gains expertise in a field, the thing you notice is that they understand the category busters. They know how and when and where to break the rules that come out of tree-based decisions. And by virtue of that, their cognitive structures are graphs. And so this should really be a lesson for those of us who are interested in artificial intelligence. Going forward, when humans develop expertise in a topic, their cognitive structures for it are graphs. So to bring this together, when you, when you think about the kinds of challenges that people face in business, and when you think about that journey that people go through when they're learning a new subject, learning how to gather expertise and knowledge in a particular subject. This leads towards graphs as being an answer to handling complexity, sense-making by leveraging graph patterns. Now, conversely, there's an anti-pattern. So uh, from the field of behavioral economics, there is something called ambiguity aversion. And this is where people, some people, when faced with complexity and uncertainty, they will do everything they possibly can to avoid it sweep it under the rug. And so this is a known problem in psychology. It's also a known problem in financial markets. Uh, and it's something to be aware of as we are addressing more and more complex contexts in business and addressing those with artificial intelligence, especially. So let me change gears here a little bit and talk about knowledge graphs. I'm sure you've probably heard the term. Uh, I want to talk about this in very general sense at first, uh, you have the notion of a graph where there are many different entities that are represented. Each entity will have a name and some attributes. And then there are links, there are relationships among those different entities. There may be some vocabularies that are used to help describe. Uh, these are uh, effectively uh, shared definitions that we agree on for standards um, to help describe what kind of entities and relations and values there can be. And it's, it's a really flexible way to represent a, a complex data scenario. Now, the thing is, if you've worked in object, writing code for object-oriented languages, and especially class hierarchies, you've, you've already heard almost all of these terms, probably by different names, but you've already heard all these other terms. 
Um, so it, it should be relatively familiar. The other thing is just thinking in terms of shapes. Um, data objects within a graph are represented as shapes. And so notions about geometry, about looking a little further, topology, how to recognize patterns, he's become very important when you're working on graphs. Now there's some great primary sources. I would like to reference, especially uh, Claudio Gutierrez and my friend Juan Saqueda. They had an excellent article at ACM this year. And you can go back through uh, Natasha Noy, Deborah McGinnis, of course, wrote a foundational paper about 20 years ago in this field. And then you can even go back into the 19th century. Charles Sanders Peirce uh, wrote really describing knowledge graphs back in 1882. Now, there are different types of graphs. Certainly, uh, the whole uh, constellation of technologies in W3C, so the semantic web technologies as a category, RDF and OWL and SCOS and all that. But then there's also property graphs. Label property graphs are typically what a lot of graph database vendors will be using. Uh, there's certainly some work in progress to try to align these two approaches to something called RDF star. A lot of progress has been made on that. But one of the points I want to make is it's not just these two categories. There are actually other types of graphs that we really need to understand to get the full picture and have complementary technologies. Uh, working with the Knowledge Graph Conference and that community, uh, I've helped to curate a list. There are more than 40 different graph database vendors currently. Even so, you know, our team, when we're out in industry working in this area, what we hear from industry customers is they, they really prioritize scalable graph compute, more so than say database features. Um, and I, I'll just throw out there, I mean, most enterprise organizations already have databases. They already have SAP, IBM, Oracle, SQL Server, et cetera. And this recalls to me uh, six years ago, the first time that I returned to Madrid for my second year at Big Things, uh, circa 2015. There were a lot of MPP vendors who were doing distributed databases based on Hadoop. And then Spark came along and just cleared out that field. The thing was at the time, what, what businesses needed, what people needed was more horizontal scale out for compute, which Spark provided. Something that supported the business use cases very directly. And it didn't come along with a lot of the heavyweight management that the MPP vendors were, were typically requiring from IT. So I think that we're at a very similar point in time. There's a lot of graph database vendors, very interesting technology, very amazing work. Um, but the, the demands from industry are for more of this kind of horizontal scale out. And so we'll probably see more emphasis on that. And to add to it, I, I know I showed this slide in a talk before, but uh, Eric Jonas and other folks at UC Berkeley, uh, the same lab that came out with Spark and Ray, they did this paper really looking at the trends of the physics that are driving trends in cloud computing, and then the economics that are driving trends that follow from the physics. And one of the major things that they've said is this, this large long-term arc of decoupling computation and storage. We'll say they, they scale differently, they, they're priced differently, they're used differently. And the bottom line there is that if you're trying to wrap computation in the guise of a database, you're probably going against the trend. Also, I really like this paper from Google, uh, this talks about introducing Path Query for their work with their, their Pregel infrastructure, graph infrastructure. And part of it, they go and they do a compare and contrast of different uh, graph query languages. So Sparkle, Cypher, Gremlin, uh, these are popular graph query languages. They do a compare and contrast with their path query work. It's notable that Google has introduced some constraints, uh, some trade-offs and constraints into their language, which then provide better guarantees for the behavior of, of graph technologies at scale on distributed systems. Having worked with implementing Sparkle query engines, Cypher query engines, I, I've got to tell you that I, I think we'll see more and more projects along the lines of what Path Query has been doing. Now, another question. 
When you ask people, what is the shape of their data? They'll typically describe something that's a rectangle, right? It's a, a table, it has rows and columns, it's a matrix, it's a spreadsheet. And that's good, that's a, that's a, that's a good way to look at data, except when it's not. The problem is that if, if you look into the hood, if you look at a spreadsheet, the thing that makes a spreadsheet work internally is its dependency graph. That's how it's calculated. And the thing that makes a SQL query work is the query plan, which is a directed acyclic graph. And on top of that, it also has a schema, which is a entity relationship diagram, another kind of complex graph. So these very tools that simplify data for us, they actually have graphs internally. And one of the problems that we run into is that by obscuring the graph, we are obscuring the metadata and the business rules, which are so important for leveraging data. And that creates a kind of tech debt. And of course we see this, I don't know if you've heard, but uh, uh, there's a, a researcher, Elena Hermans out of the uh, Netherlands, who did her work on understanding spreadsheets and uh, really fascinating. Uh, out of the global 2000, about 95% of firms do the last part of their, their tax reporting based just on spreadsheets. And those spreadsheets change from quarter to quarter. There's not a lot of consistency. So there's a lot of tech debt, a lot of hidden information uh, in terms of business rules and metadata that is so crucial that gets obscured. Now, Gartner, they'd been kind of lukewarm talking about graphs for a long while, but they did an abrupt about face uh, in uh, February of this year. And they say that by 2025, graph technologies will account for 80% of data analytics, up from 10% this year. Also, they say that 50% of the inquiries that Gartner receives about artificial intelligence are about use of graph technologies. So it's been a, a real change there in the thinking. And what it is, is this point about exposing metadata and business rules, not hiding that. The very thing that gets obscured by relational databases and spreadsheets, and which has led to a lot of tech debt, is what is so valuable in complex business contexts. Um, now, when you talk to people about use cases, I, I like to study about uh, producing case studies in this field. But when you talk with people about use cases for graph technologies, they'll probably say, well, that's for Facebook, that's, that's for Google, Amazon. And it's true that the tech giants all have large graph practices. Um, but what I want to, to show is really the larger graph opportunities are elsewhere, outside of technology. Uh, you find this kind of applications are, are very strong, especially in verticals like finance and pharma and manufacturing. And, and think about it. If you have a factory, the data exhaust from factories, you know, one factory alone could be measured in exabytes per day. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities in industry, not just in, in tech firms. I want to provide a sampler of some of the public use cases uh, and I, I'm really super impressed with uh, Barbara Rossi's team, what they're doing with network medicine. And I, I think that uh, out of everything I've seen, this is probably has the most impact for people long-term. Um, certainly in terms of retargeting drugs, drug discovery, you see this work at Novartis and AstraZeneca and Roche and others. Um, I, I really like this video here from Stefan Reiling talking about how they, they use uh, graph-based uh, machine learning to guide some of their discovery and research priorities. And then in manufacturing, there's BASF and Siemens and, and Bosch and others. Uh, I really like this video here from my colleague, Yana Zalas, talking about BASF and uses for very large graphs in manufacturing. And then in FinTech and finance, uh, you know, you've got Refinitiv and Bloomberg and Financial and others, um, all making really large scale use of graphs in finance. Um, and also, uh, you know, to talk some about the tech companies, Lyft, uh, there's a great case study by Mark Grover in this article on Medium about data context and uh, uh, compliance and what they learned. And also from Luna Dong about uh, the challenges of the product graph at trillion node scale at Amazon. Um, when you are working in data science, graph data science, it's relatively similar to typical workflows that you would see. Uh, there's a few changes though, so I'll, I'll point these out. One is that uh, you know you, you start out by integrating data sources, probably across different business silos. Integrating data into a graph 
is really one of the big challenges, but also one of the big opportunities. And it probably comes from other databases. So this is why I think that in terms of graph technology, I think maybe it's not so much about system of record, it's more about data integration and overlay. Um, and this is where I differ maybe from some of the graph database vendors. Um, when you get to the stage of preparing data, cleaning up data, which of course is a big thing in data science, then you, you see some real differences. With graphs, you're worried about different things in addition to what you're already worried about with cleaning up data quality and all. But things like transitive closure for inheritance, uh, that's very problematic to do in a relational database. But now you can do this with graphs. Cycle detection, it's also something that's uh, a kind of data quality problem in graphs. Um, and it's important to remove cycles if they were there by error before you go and do some of the algorithms. That's a very common kind of data preparation. Um, similarity analysis and with that deduplication, these are things that you try to do them with SQL, it's gonna bring the database to its knees. But in graphs, you can have much more efficient ways to, to accomplish this. Once you've prepared your data, you start to apply perhaps more semantic overlays this can be used for quality checks. Um, but then I wanna say that, you know, when you get into the use cases, it, it, there's some similarity and some differences with, with what you see in data science. Certainly there's a lot of great work with visualization. And when you can put interactive graph visualizations in front of a, of a business unit leader, someone who knows the domain that they're working with, uh, you know, these patterns just really pop out of the graphs. Also dashboards, of course, related to that. And you know other areas too in terms of the modeling that we do, but but working with graphs, you you also need to be able to work with graph algorithms. And there's a, a lot of uh, very very useful uh, techniques there of how we can gain insights uh, through graph data science by leveraging particular kinds of algorithms. Certainly, there's graph neural networks and geometric deep learning. So building deep learning models, you can think of graphs as a kind of feature store for training those models. But also in industry it's very interesting to see so much work in operations research. So think of graphs also as a feature store for the parameters that go into optimization models, uh, linear programming, dynamic programming, these kinds of things, what you need to be able to control the factory. So operations research, actually, this is where AI and OR start to align more. And in terms of understanding these kinds of, of business use cases, I like to use this as a lens. Uh, there's a triangle, three vertices. So know your business, know your data, know your customer. And when you look at the use cases in the different verticals, well, know your customer is a regulatory requirement in FinTech. It's a pretty big deal, KYC. Market intelligence is somewhat related to that, risk analysis, but you can go around the circle here. Uh, it's, it's a way of understanding these use cases and really what is the goal that you're trying to, to build out of, out of graph technology use. And so in summary of graph thinking, you know, if you have a simple business context, you can just uh, establish the facts, uh, play, you know, follow the rules, the best practices. It doesn't take a, a lot of training to do that. If you have a more complicated kind of business scenario, you need to go in and do some analysis. You're probably using a, a data lake, um, but, when you have a more complex kind of context, this is where uh, real experts need to be able to go in and discern patterns to, to probe the situation, sense what kind of patterns are emerging and then make informed decisions off that. And this is where you probably need a graph. This is how teams of people and machines learn. And so it's how organizations learn. This is where graph thinking plays such a vital role. Okay, real quick, uh, let me shift over to thinking sparse and dense. This is sort of the flip side of how do you apply the technologies. So not to go into too much math, but in algebraic graph theory, we have this notion of transforms between rich, complex graphs and what we call algebraic objects. So we can go from a graph and transform it into a vector or into a matrix or into a tensor but we can also transform back from these objects back to put information into the graph. And there's a lot of great work that gets done that way. Uh, not negative matrix factorization. Factorization methods are where 
you take a, a graph, you represent it as a matrix, you do some, some graph algorithms on it, and then you, know, you can gain a lot of insights that way. And this has been how people have worked with graphs for a long time, because, well, working with tensors was very expensive. But of course, you've probably heard of tensors used for, for deep learning and, and other areas there. So the point that I want to make is that sometimes you must blend the symbolic representation with a numeric representation. And certainly, when you're working with graph algorithms or deep learning or visualization, this requires that kind of numeric representation. But then other times, you need the symbolic when you're working with natural language, and regulatory compliance, human loop, domain expertise, explainability. These require symbolic. So the two have to go together, not just shoved into a matrix. And so I like to think of this as thinking sparse and dense with all apologies to Daniel Kahneman. Uh, this is where when you're in a data workflow, you, you really take into account the trade-offs between how you represent the different stages. Sometimes you're working more sparse and sometimes the data must be put into more dense form and then other times transformed back out. This is crucial for taking advantage of the hardware accelerators. So for instance, if you're doing deep learning, uh, when you're training your convolution layers, you pack the data, vectorize it into a very dense representation and crunch it on GPUs. But then when you go to calculate your loss function, that's aggregation. And that's typically bandwidth limited, not compute limited. And that's more sparse. And we see this throughout workflows in data science. When you're doing data preparation, it's probably very sparse. When you're training a model, it's probably dense. But then when you go back out to the customer, you have to bring it back into the sparse symbolic space. So I'll just leave a pointer here. Uh, earlier this year, Dean Wampler and I wrote a mini book uh, working with the uh, engineering leads from the open source machine learning projects at NVIDIA. And I'm uh, really grateful to get to work with those folks. Uh, there's a free download for it, but we explore this idea of thinking sparse and dense. And if you haven't heard, uh, definitely watch this space. Um, there's something called Legion that's been developed at Stanford over the past few years, and also Legate, more the application layer. It's a, a next generation of cluster scheduling for Pi data. So the idea is how can we take supercomputing and be able to access it just with Python for data science. Uh, this is much more aware of, of memory objects in task workflows. So it's a next generation beyond as far as a scheduler. Uh, so you don't waste so much time moving data around between different CPUs, GPUs, that kind of thing. There's some great resources here, especially from Michael Bauer. Um, and the reason we care is because graph neural networks have become a very big deal. Uh, this notion of geometric deep learning. Um, you know, Michael Bronstein and others, I, I think, have, have really written the canonical papers in this field. Uh, there's also a lot of really great work in terms of like motif mining, motif prediction. So certainly I'm, I'm enjoying the work coming from uh, Masih Vesta and others in that area. And, and also, <clears throat> you know, talking about graphs, uh, there's a lot of things you can do with graphs. Um, axiomatic work like W3C technology, query languages, visualizations, graph neural networks. The problem is these different camps don't talk with each other very much. And their software doesn't really talk with each other very much either. This is a major hurdle to overcome. And so I've been working on a project for the past year. Uh, some of this is for commercial reasons, working in manufacturing, as I mentioned, but it's possible to leverage open source to produce really large scale distributed multi-tenant graphs using Ray, using Arrow, uh, and, and leverage the hardware to accelerate this. Um, not all of this is open source yet, but we're working toward that. There is an earlier project that we started last October that is open source, it's called KG Lab, and it's our work toward integrating many different areas of graph data science, um, building graphs, making it more Pythonic, if you will, to do this kind of work. We have this all on, on GitHub. Uh, there's Jupyter Notebooks for each different kind of area that show examples that you can get in and use. Uh, certainly we do a lot of serialization in different formats, but we found that Parquet is a couple order of magnitude faster than the others. Um, we do a lot of work with visualization like with PyBiz and Cairo, but certainly our friends at Graphistry, we're doing some integrations toward them. Um, you can query, but then you get back a pandas data frame. So again, very Pythonic. 
uh, you can do validation with Shackle. The, the prescription is like unit tests for graphs. I'm really excited about Shackle. And graph algorithms with KuGraph, NetworkX, iGraph, but also training neural networks in terms of uh, graph neural networks, PyTorch Geometric, DGL. And I definitely want to shout out to my friends at Recogni. Um, Rubrics is a, a really excellent uh, open source platform for uh, being able to integrate uh, PyTorch Geometric with Hugging Face and others. There's also uh, probabilistic work. We, we've done integrations with PSL, probabilistic soft logic, uh, for being able to apply probabilistic rules and, and measure uncertainty in different regions of a graph. Let me show some examples of that. And uh, finally, to wrap this all up, the idea is there are different kinds of inference that you can use in AI. And we want to provide ways to integrate these so you can mix and match and bring these together and make complementary solutions for more kinds of hybrid AI, if you will. Really bring together what can you do with the query languages as well as with graph networks, as well as with visualizations and probabilistic graphs, et cetera. So I wish you well on working with graphs. And uh, if you want to get a hold of me, uh, here's some ways uh, I'd love to talk with you further. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Paco, thank you so much. Can you hear me there, Paco? Yeah? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Paco, Elena. what a fascinating presentation. I loved it, especially the beginning with that village, which uh, uh, it was so clearly, so well explained. You know, and I'm, I'm a lawyer by profession, so imagine. Fantastic. Uh, Paco, I guess in that village, you are the uh, cider brewer, yes? Because Paco... <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> I'm excited. So for those who don't know, Paco brews cider on his free time in California. So Paco, next year <laughs> when you come to the Big Things Conference in person, bring a couple of bottles of those, <laughs> of that of uh, cider of yours. <laughs> it was fascinating. So, so clearly explained, but there's so much, uh, so much to take, uh, to take away, uh, very intense. In this sense, uh, Paco, we don't have much questions time for questions but one question they ask you is um, and please I'm reminding the audience to keep sending your questions well in advance otherwise we don't have time at the end you know we're in the chat Paco when, when they ask you when does a graph become a knowledge graph is there a ah, yeah interesting I think I think the short answer there is um, so we have these ideas of, of standard vocabularies and uh, this is a way for people to have common shared definitions uh, so that when we start to describe data in a graph, we're measuring it with the same units or, or we can describe which units we're using. So once you take the data and start to connect it together and have relationships, you build a graph. But then when you start to apply some of these vocabularies, uh, this metadata, that's when you start to have more of the knowledge graph because that's when you can operate on it with different types of AI tools uh, for inference. And, and really gain uh, those kinds of capabilities. Okay. Uh, Paco, they also want to know, uh, what are you currently working on? That it's, if you could advance us some, uh, some of the news you will bring us <laughs> for next year's uh, <laughs> edition. Some of the latest thing that is, uh, gets, gets you fascinated and doesn't let you sleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, uh, you know, we're, we're working with um, a manufacturing firm in Europe. Uh, and certainly we have a lot of our colleagues in Madrid. So I want to shout out to my friends in North Madrid. Um, but we're looking at these use cases in manufacturing where uh, graphs are, are extremely vital for understanding things like uh, waste mining and understanding sustainability and carbon footprint across a complex supply chain of many, many vendors worldwide. So as you, as you get into these really difficult kinds of industrial problems, this is where graphs can can really have a lot of real world impact. Okay, f fascinating. And you said it can be applied in any, uh, in any um, vertical, I mean, in every sector. You mentioned examples on financial. You also gave us, I have written down here, pharmacy, finance, manufacturing. In any yeah. sector, or is there a sector where graph uh, design, graph thinking couldn't be applied and is not recommended? Well, I, I think that the litmus test for that is if you take some people who are experts in a field, and you have them in a room in front of a whiteboard and ask them, describe the problem that you work on every day in your business. I guarantee they'll start to draw some bubbles on the whiteboard and connect them. They'll start drawing a graph. So this is how people, when they represent domain expertise, this is typically how experts think. And I, I think that's the, the, the virtue of, of why graphs are so powerful is because it's so close to how human experts think about the problem. 
It's absolutely amazing. Actually, it's so uh, we should send those experts or those uh, businessmen um, and women that explanation of your village at the beginning, because when you compare <laughs> how Hannah <laughs> and and Aidan and and uh, Chris uh, are related, and then you put it on a on a piece of paper which is uh, is a square, you lose the perspective. You said at the beginning, uh, and I and I quote because I, I to me that was clearly. The, uh, the definition is we lose the percep perception of pattern, which is what we're looking for at the end of the day, right? Uh, and, and Paco, just a couple, I think we still have a bit of time, but not much. You mentioned a few, a b few books of colleagues and uh, references for you and uh, co colleague of colleagues of yours. Would you, uh, from all those you mentioned, you've given us a lot of uh, information and uh, we didn't have time to catch them all. So they ask you, which one would you, would you think is the one that gives you a better overview or the one not to begin with because our, our viewers are quite technicians and techno te what, quite techy but would, which one would you choose if you go to your desert island disc you remember that <laughs> that program where you can only take yes. one book to, to a desert island which book will you take well it, i will post the link to my slides i have a, all these links are, are in the slides there's a lot of references excellent um, and and i would definitely point there's a few communities in the world there's uh, certainly the Knowledge Craft Conference, KGC, and there's a community of 2,000 people on the Slack. So a lot of experts who want to interact and, and help you out with, with graph problems. Also, there's Connected Data World based out of London, a uh, similar community and, and events. Um, in terms of climate science, there's something called ESIP, which is part of the Earth Observatory agencies, uh, and a lot of use of Knowledge Graph there. And, uh, and uh, some other communities as well. I, I lead, uh, I, I moderate a graph data science linking yeah. group. So, you know, see us there too. Wow. And I also recommend everybody to check on uh, Paco's website. He has a fantastic website full of uh, all these quotes and comments. He's totally crazy scientist, as he's saying. <laughs> he is uh, not the, the normal uh, speaker. Uh, he says what he thinks all of the time. So check into his website. He has a fantastic drawing of himself. Uh, done by somebody else, I guess. Uh, yeah. And uh, so check his website. It's fascinating. We'll stay tuned with you, Paco. Thank you so much for joining once again on this Big Things Conference. Next year, we have to meet in Madrid, as, uh, as promised, in hopefully. So thank you, Paco, for coming all the way to California. And we'll see you next year, if we're not before then. Thank you, Paco, Nathan, and bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>